First, let me define what an ecosystem is. According to the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, it is a dynamic complex of plant, animal and microorganism communities and their non-living environment interacting as a functional unit. Major ecosystem categories are terrestrial, freshwater and marine. All of these ecosystems are linked to the atmosphere and therefore atmospheric pollutants can affect all of them. In addition, some ecosystems can also emit pollutants to the atmosphere and act as natural sources. For instance, biological processes related to vegetation and soils can emit nitrogen compounds. Even if the air pollution is global, we can distinguish a scale effect of air pollution impacts on ecosystems. Local impacts can be seen close to emission sources, like industrial or urban ones. For instance, lead occurs naturally in the earth crust, but this heavy metal is also produced by smelters or by cars using leaded petrol before being removed progressively worldwide. Lead has the potential to be transported over long distances, but also affects the ecosystems in the vicinity of the sources. For example, let me show you a map of a contaminated soil. At the center of this map, where an industrial site is located, the concentrations of lead are about 1000 ppm. This map shows, as you move away from this industrial site, the farmland contamination decreases. Contaminated soil causes problems of metal poisoning that deteriorate plants. For example, experimentations were done on rice seedlings. They were grown in a nutrient solution containing lead at various concentrations. The results showed that the plant biomass and the chlorophyll content of rice leaves decreased as we increased lead concentrations. The toxic effects of lead on plants are multiple and depend on a variety of factors, including the lead concentration and the duration of exposure. Besides, even if the pollutant source is no longer active, heavy metals have the characteristic to accumulate in soils, in living beings and in the food chain. Impacts on ecosystems at the regional scale are mainly associated with atmospheric pollutants transported over long distances. For instance, sulfur and nitrogen compounds involved in atmospheric deposition are associated with the acid rain phenomenon affecting both soil and water. Soil acidification depends on two principal factors. The amount of acid deposited and the soil resistance based on easily weatherable minerals. Soil acidification can result in the surface water acidification. In some cases, additional elements such as aluminium, naturally present in soils in a non-toxic state, can be mobilized and reached concentration levels harmful for plants and aquatic organisms. For instance, in Europe, during the 1970s to the 1990s, acid rain caused a fish stock depletion in Scandinavian lakes and a widespread forest decline in parts of Central Europe, such as tree degradation. Fortunately, the chemical and biological recoveries of these lakes and forests, following a reduced deposition of sulfur, became evident 30 to 40 years later. However, acid rain caused by sulfur and nitrogen deposition still exist in sensitive ecosystems and their remediation takes time. In addition, nitrogen compounds can be responsible for soil eutrophication. As nitrogen is a plant nutrient, its deposition can stimulate the biological growth of plants at first, according to the soil type, but chronic nitrogen deposition implies a nitrogen saturation effect in soil. This eutrophication results in the loss of plant species and changes in the vegetation composition. Direct damage can also occur at high concentrations of gaseous nitrogen in ambient air, like bleaching, leaf discoloration, and higher susceptibility to plant stress. For example, Herbel is a plant sensitive to increased nitrogen deposition and UK scientists suggested that this species is likely to become endangered in the near future. Global impacts can be related to the intercontinental transport of long-life air pollutants. For instance, ozone is not directly emitted into the atmosphere, 
but formed in complex photochemical reactions from gas phase air precursors, as described in more detail in another video. Ozone precursors can be transported over long distances and thus ozone can be formed far from the emission areas. It has a significant effect on vegetation, including the decrease of photosynthesis, growth and yield reductions, visible leaf injury and, in severe cases, death. These two pictures show characteristic visible ozone injuries on sensitive plant species, like on the left, chlorotic motile on pine needles, and on the right, stipple on red alder leaf. Moreover, this impairment of photosynthesis by ozone changes the land carbon sink, which contributes to an indirect radiative forcing of climate change. The case of persistent pollutants, such as atmospheric mercury, is also interesting to point out. Mercury is mainly generated by coal-fired power plants, predominantly in the form of gaseous elemental mercury. Due to its low reactivity in the atmosphere, it has a long atmospheric lifetime. Besides, elevated mercury levels have been measured in many remote regions of the world. The remaining challenge is to reduce global background levels. Mercury deposition is a critical issue because it can be transformed by bacteria in anaerobic conditions into methyl mercury, which biomagnifies through the food chain and bioaccumulates in individuals. On the diagram below, the concept of biomagnification is illustrated. The level of mercury increases at each step of the aquatic food chain, here from microplankton to human beings via seafood. This example of intercontinental transport applies as well to other types of harmful chemicals, like some persistent organic pollutants. They may also remain intact in the environment for long periods and can achieve a wide geographical spread. In the previous slides, we have explained that several types of pressure can affect an ecosystem and that the stressors might come from local or global origins. The relationship between exposure to an atmospheric pollutant and its impacts on ecosystems is nevertheless complex to quantify. An assessment of the various impacts is frequently used in management actions to optimize the restoration of an ecosystem. The figure on the right represents the total impact on ecosystems from different stressors. The blue bars represent the individual effect of stressors and the dashed black lines represent the total impact. In this example, from the top to the bottom, the stressors can either have no cumulative impact or one of them can be dominant against the others. If cumulative impacts are observed, they can be additive, multiplicative or mitigative when the total impact is less severe than expected. In order to determine the magnitude and significance of cumulative effects, an impact criterion needs to be compared against thresholds and to baseline conditions. The risk of air pollution toward ecosystems can be assessed by a critical load. It has been defined in 1988 as a quantitative estimate of an exposure to one or more pollutants below which significant harmful effects on specified sensitive elements of the environment do not occur according to present knowledge. Research scientists develop modeling and empirical approaches to calculate this parameter, but large uncertainties make the determination of critical loads complicated. This map represents the average accumulated accidents of critical loads for eutrophication over Europe, where colored grid cells from blue to red are in accidents, indicating that the ecosystems are vulnerable to atmospheric deposition of nitrogen. The type and severity of damage depend on several environmental and biological factors, for example, low temperatures, dry soil conditions, and long frost periods can lead to higher sensitivities. The critical load indicator has been widely used since the 1980s to manage air pollutants and define control strategies to achieve air pollution reductions. To sum up, air pollutants have a chronic effect on ecosystems even if significant negative impacts are sometimes difficult to perceive.
This is illustrated by the soil response to atmospheric deposition. In this illustration, the physical chemical process of acid deposition from atmospheric fallout starts at stage 1 and reaches the critical load indicator at stage 2. Yet, at this stage, the ecosystem response on the bottom graph shows that no damage is likely to occur because its criterion has not been reached due to a time delay before it happens. At stage 3, although mitigation measures have been implemented to reduce air pollutants and acid deposition is decreasing, the ecosystem response, and therefore the damage, is maximum and continues until stage 4. The ecosystem is considered to have recovered at stage 5 only. Such time-dependent estimates are called target loads or dynamic critical loads. This emphasizes that environmental recovery is slow, as exemplified by the case of a Norwegian lake over the last 40 years. Since the 80s, the atmospheric deposition of sulfate has decreased, so the pH in lake water has increased again. This higher pH, or lower acidity, has led to improvement in fresh water fauna, especially for sensitive living beings in the aquatic food chain, like zooplankton, mayfly, and salmon, for example. Yet, because recovery is controlled by a large number of factors, such as biological activity, soil, and climate, a simple chemical improvement is generally not sufficient for the ecosystem to return quickly to its original state. In that particular case, as can be clearly seen, it actually took decades for the lake and its inhabitants to overcome the damage.